feel like a 90s teenage movie gangbanger right now. All I need is the lip liner, lip gloss look, and I'm set. Hey everyone, if you don't know, my name is Christine and I am chronically ill. But you don't, yes, I know, I don't look sick. But I am. So when I was 16 I was diagnosed with Evans syndrome and that caused secondary hypertension and whatever the term is for high heart rate. I also have hypogammaglobulinemia. global anemia, don't even know if I'm saying that right, and I have hemophilia. Yes, I know. You're a girl, you have hemophilia? What? Yes. Women bleed too. Hashtag women bleed too. I also have two types of anemia. <sighs> I think that's all. Let's hope that that's all. I don't know how the lighting looks, but it is going to storm for the next four days in Pennsylvania, so this is what we're dealing with, and I'm doing daily uploads in February, and I need to film. I just need to film. So this is going to be a very long video. I already know, because I'm going to be telling you about my battle with my illnesses. So if you want, get a snack, get some tea, whatever your fancy is, vodka, I don't know. Sit down, and I hope you enjoy listening to me complain. No, I'm not really going to complain. I'm just going to tell you about like what is going on with my health because it has kind of the most requested video that I've ever gotten. So I was always that child that got sick a lot. I never was diagnosed with anything I had tests on, but I was the kid that got everything. If it went around school, I was going to catch it. And I always thought I just didn't have a very good immune system. I didn't think that it was an autoimmune disease, which I probably should have, but like give me a break. I was like 10. So when I was young, I had a lot of energy. I could rollerblade for hours. I could ride my bike until my butt got sore. I got calluses on my hands. And then I could, I could sleep for two hours and then get up bright and early the next morning and be on the go. And I love that about myself. I really felt like I could do a lot. I could accomplish a lot. I could get a lot done in a day. And then something happened. I just woke up one day and I didn't feel very good. I felt very tired and sluggish. And I had night terrors as a kid a lot. So I thought maybe it was night terrors. Oh, I also have vertigo. But that's not like a chronic illness or anything. So I told my mom I'm getting really tired all the time. And maybe I should see the doctor. She didn't believe me. She thought I was making it up. She thought I wanted to get out of school. I have to say, I was a very studious kid. I didn't take off a lot of time in school because I wanted to. It was more so because I had to because I got sick a lot, uh, especially while I was in school. So many germs, so many germs. And whenever I'm in a public setting with a lot of people, nine times out of ten, I'm going to catch something. I'm actually sick right now. I have a sinus infection, but I'm starting to feel a little bit better today. I do have a lot of pain on this side on my face, though. So I would go to school, and I would just fall asleep in my classes, and I never did that. I never fell asleep in my classes because I could never just fall asleep anywhere. And all of a sudden, I was becoming the person that fell asleep everywhere. And I started falling asleep in all of my classes, and my teachers knew something was wrong because I was always bundled up. I was always freezing. And I started to bruise a little bit more, and they had said to me, you know, maybe you should see a doctor, maybe you have anemia. I brought this up to my mom, she still didn't believe me, still thought I was making enough to get out of school. So I was under 18, I needed my mom there, the doctors, the doctor wasn't going to see me without my mom. So unfortunately, I couldn't go myself. Then I started to get nosebleeds, I noticed my heart rate was a little bit higher, and um, I started to bruise a ton. And one day I woke up with huge bruises all over, like softball sized bruises all over, especially on my legs. And I had brought my mom into the room. I was like, mom, I need to show you something. So I had to remove my jeans to show my mom. And I said, I woke up like this. And she immediately took me to the doctors. I went to my doctors that day. I had a doctor who took walk-ins and he took a blood test. Two days later, I got a phone call from my doctor telling me my red blood count, my hemoglobin, and my platelets were extremely low and I needed to see a specialist. He recommended that I go to St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia. CHOP is better, I just wanted to say that. I had to see Dr. Schaefer. He's a hematologist. He's still there, I believe. Don't see Dr. Schaefer. I highly suggest you don't if you are in the Philadelphia area and you need a hematologist or your child needs a hematologist, don't take him to see Dr. Schaefer. I know other people that went to him and strongly disliked him, so it's not just me. They took 30 tubes of blood this day, so much blood, and afterwards I felt hella woozy, really weak, and very tired. 
So I'm sitting down, I'm waiting, I see the doctor eventually uh, after he gets all my results and he diagnoses me with Evans syndrome. So Evans syndrome is a rare autoimmune disease that your body will make antibodies that attacks its platelets, red blood cells, and or white blood cells. You can have any form of the three. You need to have two of those. If you only have a platelet problem, then you have ITP. Um, so ITP and so for me, it's ITP and my red blood cells and my hemolytic anemia. That's my combination. My ITP is the chronic uh, portion. My hemoglobin can be pretty chronic too sometimes, actually. I just got a phone call from my doctor scaring the crap out of me because he called me from another hospital, which he never does. So he just tested me for cancer. So I was like, oh my gosh, I have cancer. But no, he was calling to tell me my iron has continuously dropped, but my hemoglobin went up a little bit. It's not normal, but it went up a little bit. So I got good news and bad news. I was also diagnosed with an iron deficiency. And um, apparently he diagnosed me with hypogamoglobal anemia, which he did not tell me about. And hemophilia, which he did not tell me about. I do have these two things, but I just found out that I had them. But it was in my records, but he just never mentioned it. What kind of doctor does that? So I saw him, I saw an immunologist, I like my immunologist, his name is Dr. Conway, I completely recommend him, he was a good doctor, and I saw a rheumatologist briefly, I don't remember what his name was, or if I even liked him or not, because it was that brief. So I would see Dr. Schaefer once a week, and my other doctors. I did not like Dr. Schaefer at all, because he and his RN would come in and tell me that I was depressed. They were diagnosing me with depression basically and I didn't even have depression at this point in time in my life. So it was really frustrating to me for that. Like they're not even therapists. How can they diagnose me with depression? But they were. They were telling me the reason why I was tired is because I have depression and I needed to see a therapist. And I would tell them every week I am not depressed. I don't need to see a therapist. And they're like, well this is very depressing for you. And, you know, it can be very depressing to have Evans syndrome. I'm not going to lie. However, at that point in time, it wasn't very depressing for me because the doctor did not stress how serious Evans syndrome can be. So I had no idea. I was completely ignorant to how severe my illness was. And I was like, you know, I'm tired, but I'll get through it. No, it's very serious. I bleed a ton. My blood does not clot because I have a chronic platelet issue. So I can get a little cut and I'm bleeding like crazy. And on top of that, I have hemophilia. So I don't make the clotting protein either. So I'm just, I'm a bleeder. When I was little, if I would lose a tooth, it would look like a crime scene. So I think I had hemophilia my whole life and I just never knew. My great grandfather had hemophilia. With Evans syndrome, you can bleed externally. Or internally so you can have symptoms of bleeding you know nosebleeds gums bleeding bruises petechiae which is a light rash it's like hemorrhaging under your skin um it's not light i don't know why i said that oh my goodness my last bout with petechiae was disturbing looking those are the visible signs however that might not even happen for you you may not have any visible signs and you could still be bleeding. You could bump your head and have a brain hemorrhage if your platelets are low. You can break a major blood vessel. It's extremely serious. So this affects what I can do when I'm not in remission. You do go in and out of remission. So when I'm out of remission, I can do whatever I want. And I still take some caution because you really never know when your platelets are going to drop. So when your platelets drop below 20, that's when most doctors will start treatment. Some do it at 10. This is different for everyone. I've even heard some people say their doctors do it at 5, which is too dangerous for me. I mean, I am definitely a bleeder. Um, so again, it depends on how easily you bleed, but your blood doesn't clot. So I, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, you could walk across the street and get hit by a car. And if your platelet count is five, you could very well bleed to death. So I don't think that waiting to the low of a platelet count is smart, but every doctor is different. Every person is different, which is something I want to stress to you guys. Um, I'm not telling anyone at Owen Syndrome to do what I do or to find a new doctor. It's your personal choice. 
my doctor at the time treated 20 below and my platelets were hanging around 30 and I was having all the bleeding symptoms because like I said I am a bleeder and I have hemophilia so yes I am a bleeder <laughs> I was having all the bleeding symptoms it was really impacting my life that time of the month was really hard for me and I was getting sick a lot because I was in school like I said when I'm around a lot of people nine times out of ten I will get sick my immune system is so dysfunctional sometimes when people have a platelet issue if they get sick their platelets drop more that is my only saving grace I feel like with Evans syndrome because I get sick so much my platelets actually go up when I'm sick and then they'll drop when I'm better so it's like my immune system works while I'm sick kind of it kind of works it's it takes forever to do its job it takes forever for me to get better but it does attempt to work <laughs> it just doesn't do a very good job of it so it will attack the bad stuff and fail but it's trying to and it's no longer attacking my platelets and my hemoglobin and all that which is good for some people it's the opposite but when I do go to the doctors and I'm sick I know that my high platelet count isn't necessarily because that's the number my platelets are sticking to that's the number they're at right now because they're not currently attacking the platelets. At this point in time when I was seeing Dr. Schaefer, my hemoglobin was 6, which is very low and you will feel tired with a hemoglobin of 6. And um, you also, your heart rate will get high and you will feel out of breath and I was having all those sim symptoms. Oh, I also have asthma. Did I tell you guys that? I don't think so. I do. I need to write these things down when I go to the doctors because I really have to think about it when they're like, what do you have? And I'm like... Hold on. At that time, my doctor, my immunologist, was considering giving me, giving me some blood transfusions. My other doctor, my hematologist, was going to give me a bone marrow biopsy because it's a very normal test to have when you have Evans syndrome. It's something you should expect to get sooner or later. Our plan was, you know, wait till the bone marrow biopsy, and if my hemoglobin was still low around that time, I would be getting blood transfusions. Now, blood transfusions do not work for your platelets because your body will just destroy the blood. If you get platelets, your body is going to destroy the platelets. It will work temporarily. You will see a rise in your platelets. So this is something they will give you um, during surgeries if they really need to get your platelet count up for the surgery, but they will not give it to you as a form of treatment. It's not going to work. It might be something that they give you if you're near death. I've never had it when my platelets got to the dangerously low level um, but I've had heard of other people I usually just get IVIG so IVIG is a treatment that comes from your blood plasma this is a temporary fix it's intravenous immune globin it's a temporary fix for your platelets so it will get them up to where they need to be and then they're gonna go down eventually it normally doesn't keep them up normally your platelets will go down again so basically IVIG will be given to you before anything you need to get done like if you really need a surgery they will give you IVIG um, I've had it before my gallbladder surgery and um, when you're in danger of dying they give it to you so I've had IVIG 13 times once for a surgery 12 times because I was in danger of not living. The lowest my platelets have ever been was four. That's 4,000 per unit, um, but often people will just say four, ten, whatever your number may be. My platelets have been four on multiple occasions. They've been eight, they've been six, and multiple numbers. They've been all over the spectrum. When people ask me, what is your normal? I'm like, I don't really have a normal. Lately, it's been this number, but that can change. So I don't have a normal, some people have a normal, some people have it more chronic like I do where their platelets are going to fluctuate all over the place. Other people will stay at 70 their whole lives, stay at 80 their whole lives, and you can live a normal life with a platelet count of 80. You should be careful of what you are doing with a platelet count of 80. You should be aware that your platelet count is low and maybe you should get your platelet count checked before, I don't know. You go skydiving because you if you go into an airplane with a platelet count below 20 you will start hemorrhaging for your, from your ears or nose so maybe if you want to go skydiving get your platelet count checked or maybe if you want to get a tattoo get your platelet count checked if you need a tooth pulled get your platelet count checked beforehand if you know that you have a platelet problem but if your platelet count is 80 70 you can live a normal life with that count so something i often see on 
websites for ITP and websites for Evans Syndrome is people with those stable platelet counts talk about how they don't understand how somebody could be out of work or how somebody can say they're so sick. Well, yours is not chronic. Another person's can be chronic. Mine is chronic. Every week I would go into this doctor. I'm jumping all over the place here. I'm sorry. But every week I would go in to see this doctor and they would complain to me, you know, you need to see a therapist. You're depressed. You need to talk to someone. That's the only reason why you're tired. Um, I would get so annoyed. So one day I told the RN, her name is Virginia, I believe. I told Virginia, you know, I'm only depressed when I have to come here and see you. And she told me, well, maybe you should see somebody about that. <gasps> I couldn't win with this lady. So I went to the lady at the front desk, the next visit, and I said, can you please make sure Virginia does not come into the room anymore? I do not want to see Virginia. And she told me that they actually had a lot of people complain about her and ask her not to come into the room, that it was a very common thing. That was my dog sighing, by the way. <sighs> so apparently she probably did this sort of thing to a lot of people, and a lot of people weren't happy about it. So I had a bone marrow biopsy, and I, even though I didn't like my doctor, I expected him to be able to do the bone marrow biopsy correctly. He's a senior doctor, so... I thought, you know, like I'm saying he's a, he, I think he might have been a senior citizen, I don't know, but he was like, you know, close to senior citizen age. He was not a young doctor. He had been doing this for a while. He is a hematologist. They give bone marrow biopsies a lot, so I felt comfortable enough with him doing it. You know, I, the way they basically described it to me was, stick a big needle in you, take some of your bone marrow out, that's it. I was like, hmm, okay, that's not that bad. So, if you're awake during the bone marrow biopsy, it will be that bad. I will highly suggest if you need a bone marrow biopsy, you get sedated. Insist you get sedated because the pain won't be that bad if you get sedated. They have a really hard time getting a needle in my hand. I don't know if you can tell. I have very thin veins here. They don't pop out very much. I've tried all the tricks. Drinking a lot of water. I've had doctors put heating pads or filled balloons out with hot water even on my hands and none of it works. To get a blood test can be a little easier. To get an IV needle in is very hard. So that took forever. That took about 10 minutes, but then they finally got the IV in. You know, I had all the doctors come in talking about the process, about the anesthesia, all that prepped me for surgery. Um, they gave me the anesthesia. They also told me, you know, I could choose to have the gas mask on if I wanted. It would make it quicker. I would get knocked out faster. I chose to put the gas mask on, even though they told me you could ship a tooth, and it did. I don't know if you'll see it, but the tooth is chipped. I went back into the room, and I was there, and guess who I see? Virginia. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Not you. <laughs> Anybody but you. So Virginia um, takes my hand, and I'm all drugged up at this point. She's like, be okay it's gonna be okay and I'm like trying to pull my hand away from her it's not happening because I can't feel a thing uh, so I'm just sitting there like trying so hard to move my hand and I don't know if I moved it at all even but I was like a zombie from the anesthesia they put the gas mask over my face and then they take it off and the one doctor goes you know this smells like a beach ball does anybody have anything to make it not smell like a beach ball now if I could speak at this moment I would have said, I don't care. It'll be on me for three seconds. Just put it on my face and let's get this over with. They, oh, oh this still skews me out. The doctor took out a chapstick that was used. It was definitely a used chapstick and rubbed it all over my mask. And I was like, oh my gosh, do not put that on my face. Do not put it on my face. And then they put it on my face. And inside I'm screaming, no. I was so grossed out. So this pissed me off. And I fell asleep really quickly. I woke up in recovery and I was confused when I woke up. I was like, where the hell am I? And I jumped up and a nurse came running over. She's like, it's okay, Christine. You're in St. Christopher's Hospital. You just had a bone marrow biopsy. And I woke up really cranky, apparently, because I shouted out, oh, I'm still here. I took the blanket and I threw it over my head. And I heard the nurse laugh and a few minutes later, 
they wheeled me to another room. My mom came in and I told her immediately that I was extremely pissed off um, about the doctors. They, she came in and I was just like, they pissed me off back there. And my mom was really worried for some reason. I didn't know why at this time, but she wanted to know what they did. I'm like, I can't remember right now, but I remember that they made me mad. So I came to find that the doctor, after performing the bone marrow biopsy, came out, robe and all, robe, gloves, mask and everything. I knew I wasn't going to get through the video without my camera dying on me at least once. So my hematologist came out, fully robed, and told my mom, well maybe we shouldn't have done it yet. Maybe we did this a little too soon. So that's really weird. It's like, uh, why? Why would this be too soon? That's worrisome. You thought it was a great idea beforehand, and now that we've done it, what happened? I don't react to anesthesia the best when I get anesthesia. I feel weak for at least a whole day. I have to take a whole day to recuperate. My body just takes a while to get back to normal. That's how I always am with any time I get anesthesia. So I had that feeling, and I went home, and I noticed I had incisions in the front all right so, so these are my hips right here right like i have big hips so you know this is my hips this is the front of my hips this is the back of my hips so i had some incisions like towards the front where he had tried to go in but couldn't and i had it like more towards the side where he actually was able to go in and you know i thought okay i'm a complicated person doesn't necessarily mean anything i wasn't too concerned that night uh, I waited the necessary amount before I could eat again. My adopted brother and his girlfriend had made dinner. I took a couple bites and I ran to the bathroom and I felt so bad because I had to go puke and I could tell like his girlfriend put so much effort into this dinner and she was so nice and I just puked up her dinner. So I, I felt really bad about that. I had my period when I had this done. I had the worst cramps I ever had in my life. I do get bad cramps. These were excruciating. It was horrible, debilitating. It was so bad and I couldn't understand why because that's not how my period works. I get it bad and it sucks but it's not this bad. I didn't know it could be this bad. This is not recommended. Do not recommend doing this but I did take six mile trying to get the pain to go away and it still was very much there. Then my mom gave me Tylenol number three, Tylenol codeine. I don't like Tylenol codeine. It sometimes makes me throw up. Codeine can make me nauseated. It doesn't sit well in my stomach. But I took it and I shouldn't have because I took six mile. My mom did not know I took six mile off. She never would have given me the Tylenol codeine. So I took that because I was desperate for the pain to stop and I was crying in tears crying from my period. And I got high. That was the first time I've ever been high in my life. So I was laying there and I was like, I am definitely high right now. I feel like I'm floating. I don't recommend that. That's not a good idea. That's not good for you. Do not do that. Talk to your doctor if you have really bad cramps. That was the only time I ever did that. I usually only take Tylenol when I have cramps. A couple days later, you know, I'm not feeling very good. I have this massive headache. It's horrible. I go to bed with it and I wake up in the morning with it and I slept through my alarm. I didn't go to school this day. I was really not feeling well at all. My grandma was supposed to pick me up from school and I called her and I said, can you guys pick me up at the house because I'm not going to school today. I don't feel well. So they picked me up and they love going to breakfast. So we had to go to breakfast, but I didn't eat anything. I just sat there and I was like this the whole time, like propping my head up. I felt like I couldn't keep my head up. I was very tired, very weak, and my head just felt so painful. I go up to my grandmother's house and I basically like run in the house and collapse on the bed and I have a blanket over me and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I am just freezing. I wish I had another blanket, but I don't have the energy to move right now. My grandma came in with another blanket. I said this in my head. I did not say this out loud, so I was convinced my grandma was psychic. The next couple days were some of the worst days of my entire life. I was so sick. I couldn't drink water. I would throw up if I drank water. I couldn't eat anything. I would throw up. I was extremely dehydrated. I was in severe, severe pain. I thought I had the flu. I had a lot of flu symptoms. I had a fever. So I was thinking I definitely have the flu and I'm being a baby. Why can't I 
get over this pain. So while I was sick, my grandma would just know things. She would just know things. Like I would have a fever and she'd come in with alcohol. I don't know if you guys ever heard like rubbing alcohol on your wrists and ankles can reduce the fever and it works a lot often. I actually think it works pretty well. Um, so she would come in with rubbing alcohol when I was like, oh, I have a fever. Like I would, would not say it out loud, but she would just come in. Or if I needed Tylenol, she was in there with Tylenol. <laughs> if I needed a drink, she was in there with a drink. Um, it was very weird. I had to like eat ice at one point because I just couldn't hold any water down. So my grandma bought me Gatorade and I was taking really small sips of Gatorade to prevent throwing up. And I remember one night I woke up crying my sleep because I was in significant amount of pain. I was like, I need to go downstairs and I need to get a drink. I'm so thirsty. So I had to crawl downstairs and uh, I got Gatorade and I was like, you know what? You have to get up. You cannot just crawl around the whole time you're sick. So I forced myself to stand up and I got into the middle of the living room before I collapsed. I had the most severe pain go through my head to my toes pretty much my whole body and I just collapsed and I felt very weak and I was laying there and I knew I could just tell that if I didn't get help I was going to die and I was like the phone is right there try to crawl I couldn't barely move it was so hard to move and I was just laying there and I was like I'm gonna this is how I'm gonna die and I wasn't even being dramatic guys I was told by the doctors that I did almost die and I could tell I could feel it I started to pray to God and I asked him to make it be over and I didn't care how I wanted it to be over and in that moment my grandmother who didn't even hear me praying she just woke up and had a feeling to come downstairs and she saw me laying there and she knew and she started screaming for my grandfather to get up that I needed to go to the hospital. They rushed me to the hospital and I had a bunch of tests done. They gave me fluids and pain medicine through the IV. My pain finally went away. My fever finally broke. I slept for hours in the hospital. So they diagnosed me with a blood infection that I had gotten obviously from my bone marrow biopsy. It was really the only thing that could have given me a blood infection and they believed that he had messed up somehow because I had those incisions in the front. And so I had to be transferred to St. Christopher's which really sucked. St. Christopher's is the reason why I was in this mess to begin with and I didn't want to go back there but I wasn't 18 yet so I had to go to St. Christopher's and I was really upset about it. My grandfather, the amazing man he is, rushed me to the hospital at 4 in the morning and stayed till 8 at night and my grandfather never drove at night and he was exhausted. And he actually came and asked me if I would be okay if he went home to go to bed. I was like, you could have went home hours ago. I slept the whole time. I was fine. My mom was there even. So he definitely could have went home, but my grandfather was that amazing of a guy. So he, he tried to wait for them to transfer me, but it just took so long that he couldn't wait any longer. So I got transferred over. I finally got a room. I think it was like about 11 o'clock at night. And my mom had made sure the hospital that I came from had sent over everything that St. Christopher's would need. All of their files, all of my medical records, everything that they did, all the tests they gave me went from that hospital to St. Christopher's. My mom was home with my little brother the next day. So... When the doctor came to talk to me, my mom was not there, and the doctor told me that they were going to give me a flu swab, and they gave me a flu swab, and I know the flu swab is not always accurate. They said that the flu test was not accurate because I had flinched a little, but in my defense, I flinched a little because they shoved it so hard up my nose, they gave me a nosebleed. So, I don't know. To me, that was just an excuse. It was accurate. I feel like it came back that I didn't have the flu, but they didn't want to admit that one of their doctors was at fault. So I was told that I, they believed I had the flu, that it wasn't a blood infection. They knew that it wasn't a blood infection. I don't know how they knew, but they knew. I was also told that the hospital that I came from never sent over the paperwork. And when they went to call them, they said they lost all of my records. 
and I called my mom up immediately because I was like that just sounds so fishy to me. I told her what the doctor had told me and she said that that was a lie because the paperwork was sent over and if anyone lost the paperwork it had to be St. Christopher's and she called Nazareth and they still had my medical history and all my paperwork and all my information for my test so St. Christopher's was lying. I did sign a paper though that they wouldn't be at fault if anything had happened because I had really felt like my doctor could handle this. I just felt like it was simple enough. He was a hematologist. He does this all the time. How could it not be something that he could handle? So I got released from the hospital on a Monday. I had a doctor's appointment on a Wednesday. I had spent two weeks barely sleeping. I had spent two weeks incredibly ill fighting for my life. So. Tuesday I did not go to school. I slept and I recuperated. Wednesday I had to go to the doctors. I had to go to my hematologist to make sure that everything was up. So they checked my counts and everything went up, which was great. Everything just went up. So I was really happy about that. But I got belittled by the RN for not going back to school yet. And I said I had every plans to go to school tomorrow. I think my school will understand when Nazareth Hospital tells them I almost died. You know what I mean? And they did understand, by the way. I wasn't staying at home playing video games or skipping school and going to the mall. I was really ill. But the nurse belittled me so much. And she also belittled me for not having um, my normal appetite yet because she asked me, am I eating full meals? I said, not full meals yet. I'm eating meals, but I can't eat what I was eating before. I My stomach still feels a little weird. And she belittled me for that. Like, I just spent two weeks puking my guts off. I'm so sorry, and my stomach still feels a little strange. Like, if I eat a half of a burger, I'm sorry that I can't finish that burger, but I can't right now. So you just need to calm down. And this is when it gets real weird. So while I was in the hospital, my hematologist sent in the nurse who was not supposed to be in the room with me at all. I requested her to never be in the room with me, but she was there during the operation and she was there in the room with me and she should not have been there. He finally opens the door. I'm thinking, finally, I'm about time. I'm going to see him. And the look on this man's face, his mouth open, he froze. And he just stood there with the door ajar for a minute and goes, oh, oh Christine, sorry. And then closed his door and I never heard from him again. I never went back. I was never going to go back. They never even had me make another appointment. I think that was their plan. Hopefully I wouldn't come back. You know, maybe belittle me enough that I wouldn't want to be here because they screwed up so bad. But so over the summertime, my platelets seemed to stay around 100, which is a really good number. It's not normal. Normal is 140 to 400,000. So it was not normal but it was good enough. I wasn't having major bleeding symptoms. And when I would have bleeding symptoms, they were more minor. It was like, you know, I got some bruises, but it was summer and I was climbing on giant rocks at Pennyback Park. I was going to my doctor getting CBCs every couple months, making sure I checked it, making sure, you know, I didn't have no signs of bleeding or anything like that. So, I was pretty good and then I was planning on going to Pittsburgh for college. I went to go to the Robert Morris University and my grandfather got pretty sick. So I put off school for a little bit and I decided I was not going to be leaving Philadelphia. I wasn't leaving the city ever because my grandfather is like my father if you don't know. So I um took care of him. I also took care of my nephew for a little while. So I decided I'm gonna go get certified in, in paralegal. I really like law. I took a lot of law classes in high school. So I decided I'll do paralegal a shorter amount of time in school. I'm always sick so this might be an easier path for me than law school. Because I was gonna take like pre-law and Robert, Robert Morris University and then go somewhere else for law school. I enroll in school and maybe like a month into school, maybe not even a month, my platelets drop to eight. One day I woke up and I had a massive bruise from here to about here. And it was really big, really purple. 
So, of course, I had to make a doctor's appointment. I saw my primary doctor. I was actually out with my cousin. We were at the mall, and he calls me, tells me, your platelet count's eight. I said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> he was eight. I was like, 80? No, eight. I was like, what do I have to do? And he told me, get to the hospital right away. I'm calling them. I'm letting them know you were on your way. So my mom takes me to Jean's Hospital. I go to Jean's Hospital with my mom and I was sitting in the waiting room for a long time. We literally waited an entire day before I got sent up to a room. So I was in the waiting room for hours and I mean hours. I was reading a book and I finally get called back and uh, the doctor, the ER doctor is like, well, I don't know what to do for you. I was like oh, okay and she said well, I'm gonna give you platelets and I told her well my doctor told me before that I can't have platelets my body will just destroy them and she goes okay well I don't know what I'm gonna do then so she just leaves me basically waiting until a hematologist comes in so this is hours later like this is the next day it's like 10 in the morning and I wake my mom up I'm like mom I still haven't seen a hematologist she woke up and she realized it was 10 and she was mad and she went to the nurses and she started like raising holy hell you know she told him i better see a hematologist soon and finally a hematologist came in this is my current hematologist and he's actually pretty good i like my hematologist i travel quite a bit of ways to get to him he really he tells you how it is you know he doesn't sugarcoat things like my first hematologist sugarcoated everything and i didn't realize how serious it was i needed to get IVIG but I need to be on steroids too and I really didn't want to be on steroids because I was like afraid to gain weight and all that you know I was a little more vain back then so I was upset about that and I hate steroids like steroids and me do not get along I get a lot of really bad symptoms or side effects whatever you want to call it from steroids so he said he would try Decadron for me since prednisone makes me violently ill so he put me on Decadron and I did gain some weight from the Decadron I gained I think it was like 10 pounds I wasn't on it for too long and um Decadron made me extremely dehydrated it gave me really bad ingestion he thought maybe the Decadron would be better with my stomach than the prednisone because prednisone makes me vomit like crazy so the Decadron gave me really bad ingestion and I took antacids with it and it didn't matter I still had a really bad ingestion and it also keeps you up all night and the IVIG I typically get flu-like symptoms however if you watched my uh, health update when I came back to YouTube you know that my last IVIG infusion went terribly wrong I usually feel like I have the flu with IVIG and it sucks but it's something that you, you'll feel better from the next day so um, well in my case everyone's different but in my case that's how it is so I got IVIG I got steroids my platelets went up the next day it worked really well and I went home and then I followed up after I was done steroids with this hematologist oh by the way if you are in the Philadelphia area my hematologist is Dr. Goldstein if you need a hematologist I recommend him I was done the steroids and unfortunately my count plummeted it went really far down again and I needed an IVIG so he did the IVIG and the steroids again followed up once I was done with the steroids plummeted it again he said okay we're gonna try it one more time did it one more time same exact thing needed another IVIG treatment and then he said to me okay this is clearly not working works while you're on them but you cannot be on steroids for the rest of your life first of all they were making me very ill if that's not enough prolonged use of steroids can give you steroid induced diabetes so he did not want to keep me on the steroids for much longer so i had to start thinking about other treatment options one treatment option is to have your spleen removed a theory with evans syndrome i say theory because they say that this is fact i disagree what they say is that your spleen is trapping your platelets and killing them so if you remove your spleen then you will go into remission however it can come back so how is that true if it can come back then that's not the real reasons happening so he wanted me to have my spleen removed I didn't want to have my spleen removed it's a very permanent 
option. You can't put your sling back. Your sling does filter out the blood. So my immune system is so poor that I feel like my spleen kind of needs to be there. And I need that extra support. Some people have had great success with having their spleen removed. But there are a lot of people who hadn't and I was just not okay with having such a permanent option for a maybe outcome. I might be in remission for 20 years. I might not go into remission at all. I might be in remission for a week. I decided to go with Tuxan. Now you may have heard of Tuxan. Certain, came, certain people who are having chemo with chemo and Rituxan, I feel for you. If you have that, I feel for you because I know how awful Rituxan is. I don't know how awful chemo is, but I know how awful rituxan is, and I know chemo is really bad, so I can't imagine having both. Like, it will treat certain autoimmune diseases as well as certain cancers, and it is awful. I hated it, but it did put me in remission for over two years, two years and three months, I count it. I'm thankful for that, but it was a terrible time. So you get rituxan weekly, and you get four rounds of rituxan. Now, as I was getting Rituxan, my platelets were continuously dropping. I had scheduled it where I could go on Fridays, my day off on school, and get the Rituxan, but it didn't work for multiple reasons. My platelets were dropping, and I would have to make emergency appointments to my doctor, and I would have to not go to school because I needed to go get an IVG treatment, or I would get a phone call from my doctor saying your blood tests came in and your platelets or four, you need to get to the doctors right now. While I was in school and getting IVIG and steroids and getting Rituxan, I was on leave for four times. I go on leave for the fourth time when it came to getting my Rituxan treatments because I just had to keep going back for emergency treatments. So one week I would do Rituxan, next week I would do IVIG, then I would do Rituxan again until I finished Rituxan. So for most people, it takes them one month to do it. I, it took me two months, so that kind of sucked. I had a lot of awful side effects with Rituxan. That's actually common. It's very common to have very bad side effects with Rituxan. Now, the thing is, the benefits outweigh the negatives. So yes, you're going to get really sick, but you're also going to live <laughs> if it works. It may not work for everyone. It worked for me. With Rituxan and IVIG, they give you a lot of Benadryl, very strong Benadryl. It makes you so weak feeling. You get essentially, I guess, high on Benadryl, but you feel terrible. Your whole body feels numb. It's awful. And people call it their Benadryl-induced nap because it does knock you out. I've never stayed awake for a whole treatment and I never will because the Benadryl is so strong. My first treatment of Rituxan was the hardest one. Same thing with IVIG. My first IVIG was one of the harder ones for me. Um, with Rituxan, I actually went into shock. I got up to use the bathroom halfway through and I came back and I told the nurse, you know, I'm just, I'm not feeling well. And she's like, well, what's wrong? I was like, I'm starting to get a little achy. And then I just started to shake in the midst of me telling her how I was feeling and I just start to tremble and then they started taking my vitals and all my vitals signs were dropping and I had one nurse coming over wrapping me in blankets and I had another nurse holding my hands to see if my how bad my trembling was and if it would improve. I had another nurse stopping the Rituxan and putting in um, a bag of Decadron, which is steroids, to counteract the reaction I was having. One thing I do remember is a crowd of people, like, looking at me, like, worried. They, you know, they weren't, like, just, like, like interested in what was going on. These Eventually, my reaction stopped, and I was able to resume the Rituxan. And then, um, another thing that happened was the top layer of my skin peeled off, and it was incredibly painful. It was awful. This was one of the worst reactions, because it was so painful, and it... It took so long to heal. I tried so many lotions. I finally found one. It was an Aveeno medicated one, and if that was the only thing that worked for me. Um, then I think my teeth started to rot, which is awful. I hated it. I also felt really weak for two days, so I would get the Rituxan on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I was completely out of commission. During this time, I had people who really weren't understanding. My best friend actually complained that I didn't hang out with her enough and I was like oh, believe me I'd rather 
And then my sister one time told me that I was being a baby and she could handle the treatment so much better. I hate when people just don't understand at all. Like you don't have to understand but have a little compassion. You should be able to tell by looking at my face how I'm feeling and I'm not feeling well. And my teachers can look at my face and tell me I'm not feeling well. Then I expect my sister and my best friend to be able to give me the same regards. In all fairness my best friend did not see me like that. Um, Lacey. But um, she wrote me and was like complaining that I was not out or enough at one point and I was like uh hold up I'm not doing anything but going to the hospital and then coming home and going to my bed. I went to I went into remission for a little bit over two years I noticed I got sick a little bit less while in remission but still got sick quite often so that was still something I couldn't avoid it seems like. After I finished school so I'm a certified paralegal if any lawyer wants to hire me I know how to work Westlaw and I exceed in criminal law and I was pretty good in family law too. I was not good in real estate law, so don't hire me for that. So then I got a job afterwards because I could not get a job in paralegal. I became a custodian for a little while there. And then I went out of remission again and I kind of just hung around a stable platelet count for a little while. And But the thing was, I was so sick all the time and that I couldn't get a job because I was always sick and I couldn't be around a whole lot of people because I'm always sick and still on this way. If there are people who are sick and they come around me, oh my gosh, I like run upstairs, barricade myself in the room, I have people like Lysol the whole living room down, it's like any room that they've been in, spray that crap with Lysol, please. So I'm still out of remission. My body hemolyzed a lot over the years and caused my gallbladder to go bad and I had to have that removed. If you want to hear about my recent bout with my gallbladder and my Evans syndrome, I'm going to throw that up in the cards up here. You can click that up here if you want to go and listen to that. This video is long enough. Um, I found out that I have hypogammic global anemia and I found out that I have hemophilia. These were in my records before, like I said, the doctor did not tell me about this. Um, and that is why I'm sick all the time. So I may need, um, monthly IVIG. I'm still getting tests and things like that done so we can make a clear treatment plan for that. I'm going to go to an immunologist as well because we're hoping the IVIG, you know, will boost my immune system and I will just not be sick as often. That for me, I'm really hoping to have that happen. I hate IVIG, but I'm really hoping to have... IVIG monthly because then I feel like I could go back to work because I I won't be sick all the time like I catch everything guys everything I get chronic bronchitis I get the flu stomach virus sinus infections like you name it I get it viral pharyngitis pneumonia really bad stuff I'm trying to think is there anything else my iron's terrible so I've been tired lately my hemoglobin fluctuates goes up and down I am hemolytic anemia still but it's okay it's not good but it's not terrible right now so I'm kind of in between yeah I think that's it I think that's all I want to say it's a very long video and if you stuck around to the end I love you guys for that if you have a, an experience that you want to share let me know down below if you have Evans syndrome and you want to ask me any questions or if you have ITP and you want to ask me any questions or hypogamma global anemia or hemophilia feel free you can message me on here you can write me in a comment you can email me. My email is in the description below. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And again, if you stuck around, you guys are awesome. I love you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Bye.